I'm Bill Hodges, and this is Spotlight on Government, and I have one of my very favorite guests on. In fact, I have a lot of chat people coming on lately that I really like, but Victor Christ, you're one of my favorites. You've been on with me for years and years because of your extensive experience, not only in the com county commission, but before that in the legislature. So it's great to have you on the show. Bill, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I've always enjoyed our discussions, and I've always received good feedback from, from the audiences after the show's aired. One of the nice things I like about having you on the program is that you rarely dance around an issue. I'm not known to be <laughs> always politically correct. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty straightforward, but you know, I, I was lucky enough to, to marry a woman that's the same way, and we've got a strong marriage as a result of it. District 2 for the county commission. Would you kind of outline that for people so they get an idea of where it covers? Uh, District 2 is primarily the north half of the county, north of Hillsborough Avenue or, or Highway 60. Um, I go all the way west to Sheldon Road and all the way east up to Plant City. It, that's kind of an area you homesteaded, right? It, it kind of sort of. I for mean, a I, long time. I, I lived in Temple Terrace area people. for 26 years and when I finally married um, eight years ago, uh, we bought a home in Tampa Palms and moved over there. But I'm still, you know, central North Hillsboro has been my home for over uh, 34 years. Let's talk a little bit first about the budget because I think everybody's interested in how well the county's funded and maybe where some of the monies go. What's your feeling about our current tax structure, the amount of money that we're bringing in, and what have we got left? Well, Hillsborough County, fortunately, has been in a, a, a much better position than most of the other counties. We have not had to raise taxes here to get through the recession. Um, that, in fact, each year we actually cut taxes a little bit. Is that kind of a ceremonial thing? In a way it is, <laughs> and in a way it isn't. I mean, it really is a tax cut, and over time they adds up. Um, you know, an extra 50, 60 bucks a year to some folks is very meaningful. I mean, it could be another two uniforms for, or, or outfits for a kid in school. Um, but either way, the bottom line is we've been very fiscally efficient with our resources, looking at how we can do more with less and what can we do without of, you know, during those tough times. The economy's starting to kick back. We're starting to have a little more revenue flowing. We're looking at prioritizing our budget for the next four years and tying what we fund around what our priorities are going to be. We're saying we want to grow jobs, we want economic viability. Well, you know, that's going to take improving quality of life, lowering crime, raising education, and developing a market that people want to come to and grow their businesses. You know, that, that's almost like flag, the flag and apple pie and mum. Everybody's for lowering crime and doing it. But nobody really wants to pay for it. No, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's very costly. And we don't want to have to pay infinitum. You know, an investment today in a troubled neighborhood like the University uh, West, which is formerly known as Sioux Case City. Um, you which know, you know very well. Oh, I do. And, you know, we, every child that you are able to divert from crime and save from a, a lifetime of, of corruption is millions and millions of tax dollars saved. Is it something like forty-one, forty-two thousand dollars a year to keep someone in prison? Not quite that much, but it, it is costly. You know, it, it's along the lines of more about twenty-six. Oh, that much in Florida? Yeah, we run pretty efficiently than. in Florida. That was a lot higher than that. Oh, the, the high numbers that you're talking about death row. Oh, okay. You know, I think it was forty-seven death row, which the last numbers I saw, but death row is expensive because you know you're you're in the cell all by yourself and a lot of ancillary. Uh, support and security services. So you really feel that we're in pretty good condition budget-wise and tax-wise, that it'll take care of itself with the rises in the property values? What we need to do is go in and take a look at our fee structure to determine whether it's obsolete. Um, you know, we're collecting fees for things that really we shouldn't be, that frankly, you know, were needed at the time that we put those in place, but today aren't necessarily funding what they were originally were intended to. And to me, that's a shell game. I mean, you shouldn't collect a fee for something that, you know, you were supposed to collect it for and use it for something else. And there are areas that we probably should be readjusting that we aren't collecting a fair compensation for a service provided. But we need to go in and look at everything, put it on the table, 
and determine if it's necessary, what's it costing us, and, and how do we best fund it, and if it's not necessary, why are we funding it, and move on. What about roads and things of that nature? I noticed that we do have a lot of work to do on roads, and of course, one of the things I'd like to talk a little bit about today is transit, because I think that's, that's a real, going to become a hot button here in the county very soon. Well, we can't build enough roads to accommodate the need and the growing need. The land just isn't there. The, you know, we're already built out, and to have to go back in and buy things to tear it down, we really can't, you know, looking 50, 60, 100 years down the line, we're not going to have enough space to build the kind of roads we will need to be able to move the masses. So we're re-engineering how our communities will, will evolve with business nodes in suburban areas so that people travel less to get to and from work, to and from school, and to and from shopping. In addition, we're looking well, at... What's a business node? Let's, well, let's West talk. Shore would be a business node. Okay. Um, downtown. Would be a destination? Is that... You know, you, you have the West Shore Area Business District with the West Shore Area Residential District with the West Shore Area Shopping District. You'll have the Downtown Business District, the Downtown Living Residential District, and the Downtown Shopping District. The University Area is, an, is the third one, um, believe it or not. You know, you have the, the largest employer in the county, which is University of South Florida, and around it you have several of the largest second, third, fourth, and fifth largest employers, VA Hospital, Florida Hospital, Moffitt Cancer Center, Bosch and Loam, the list goes on. And that, that's fabulous, that whole, that whole center there of medicine. What a jewel in our crown. Oh, it's a metric that's very important for us in the future to grow our, our jobs, quality jobs, and business and industry. It's kind of like the, the yolk of the egg that you feed off of to grow and that's what we're looking at when we're working to identify and rezone and, and replot and reprioritize within the county. We're looking at five economic development districts and West Shore, Downtown, University, um, the Fairgrounds, South County and Plant City. And the reason why is we put the policies in place today and start prioritizing the expenditures around these areas and eventually the critical mass will build and it will begin to take shape. But we have to start now for down the road in order to move in that direction. I fully agree. When we just looked at mass transit last time, rapid transit, property values in the Florida were as low as they're going to be for a long time. And I was really hoping they'd buy right away at that point. Uh, but I don't see how ultimately we cannot have some form of rapid transit. And somebody says, well, we can have buses with bus lanes, but where's the bus lane going to come from? It's going to come out of the turn lanes and other things. So how do you feel on that? Well, I mean, right now I serve on the airport board, the Tampa International Airport. We just approved a $1.2 billion dollar um, renovation to the airport that we started on, you know, weeks ago that's going to take about 36 months to complete. It's the largest public construction project in, this, in the state right now. That's going to basically be the first um, uh, mass modal system of transportation in, in the county. It's going to be short, but it's going to be visible and it's going to be able to demonstrate the effectiveness of it. We're going to be moving all the auto rental companies out of the existing building to a new building, oh, a really? new parking garage, okay. out near Boy Scout Road in the mall. And we're going to build, move offices out there. And we're going to create more space in the existing airport for parking and for um, our, our travelers. Um, we're going to connect between the two, which is a lengthy distance, with a people mover that moves extremely fast oh. and efficiently. And at the end of it, there's going to be an intermodal hub that if the private sector or the city or the county wanted to connect, they could. If, that sounds like a great idea. Sure. If, if it's got to start somewhere. It, you know, if the Glaciers decide they want to have some, uh, you know, a, a quick, fast the ride from the airport to the stadium, it could easily connect there, going right through the mall. Same thing with the mayor of Tampa. If he decided he wanted to do something from the airport to downtown, he could very easily connect there. If we decided we wanted to do something between here and Clearwater and St. Pete, 
that could easily connect there. But we're going to have the airports so that we have all the auto rental companies on site, not just a handful, that we have double the parking spaces that we have today to be able to accommodate our growth. And we're going to open up space so that we can have more vendors, more choices, and frankly, a flavor and a quality when you land at our airport that you know you're in Tampa or Tampa Bay or St. Petersburg or Clearwater the minute you step off that plane. Yeah, I had the airport on the list. We were going to hit it last so we give it more time. But let's, let's go ahead and talk about it now because I moved to this area, ladies and gentlemen, because of this airport. I do seminars all over the world. and It was important to have a world-class airport to get in and out of easily. And this is probably the most civilized airport that I have ever been in, in or out of. Well, one time we were number one in the world, and over the last uh, 30, 40 years, we have slipped down to about number four um, as far as, you know, um, preference. When we're done in 36 months, we will go back up to number one. And for convenience, for technology, for um, ease of use, for um, quality of life, airports are very important to communities. They're the gateway. And for business and economic development, today with a fast-paced world, you have a lot of executives that choose to live where the quality of life is good and work in the urban settings. Exactly. We have a number of people who fly, who live in the Tampa Bay area, work in New York, work in Chicago, right now work in Panama, Panama City. Not Panama City, Florida, but Panama City, <laughs> Panama. Panama. And, and, and other destinations. And you know, they fly, they fly out on a Monday morning, they fly back Monday evening, or they fly out on a Monday morning, they fly back on a Friday afternoon. And this airport has to be very accommodating to that. Um, you know, eventually we're going to, when we're done with phase one, move into phase two, which will incorporate a whole new international hub, which will be part of the mainframe of the, of the airport, so that there's very little walking involved. So that's what I like about it. It's central. You get yes. off one, you get on the other, it's easy. We're not going to lose any of that. The look is going to continue to be the same. Um, you know, the feel is going to continue to be the same. The ease of use is going to be even better. The choices of food and beverage and services are going to be even better. And it's going to be something we'll continue to be very proud of. Unlike anywhere else that I've been, and it's funny, even our, our director, Joe Lapano, says all the airports he's worked at in his career, nowhere has he ever been where the people of the community have such a strong sense of ownership. <laughs> What are you doing to my airport? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the funny part, I, I, I really believe in the central core. Yes. I think Tampa has to be strong in order for the rest of the county to be strong. And I hear people, almost us and them, uh, Brandon, no, I don't want Brandon, I don't need this. Well, people don't fly into Brandon, they fly into Tampa. Yes. They don't fly into pa any of the Plant City or any of the others. They fly into Tampa, and if Tampa doesn't have a good reputation, they don't fly in there. Well, we have three world-class hospital and treatment research facilities in the Tampa Bay market. I won't say who they are for the sake of creating some controversy, <laughs> but they are yeah, here. Whoever you gave first, second, third. The three of them are here, and they're world-renowned and ranked, and we're lucky enough to have them here. To be able to offer them an opportunity to annex in or around the airport so that patients that have been treated could fly in and out for their follow-up um, could mean a lot to our healthcare industry. The support businesses that would jump It'd be nice start. to have a transit that came right out to that area. Absolutely. It would be absolutely wonderful. Absolutely. That's why I go to Atlanta. I don't even think about renting a car. I get on the system and I ride it to wherever I need to go. Usually wherever they dump you, there's a bus right there to go wherever else you need to go. And I never rent a car in Atlanta. Well, we've got to have a demonstration model we can show, one, ease of use, two, efficiency, and three, cost effectiveness. Not just cost effective to the rider, but cost effective to the community because there's a fear of the big white elephant that I'm going to have to pay for. We're going to build this thing, and it's going to be a drain on our budget and on our pocketbook forever. We will be. 
I mean, the people that, that believe it's not going to be, but you don't ride on roads free. You, you, you know, you that's, know? That's, it's all in how it's, it's packaged. You've got to be able to show what are the real costs and where are the real savings and be able to show the real benefits. And, you know, you've got it, and that means everything on the table. It's not going to pay for itself. I mean, there's very Actually, I, I disagree. I think it really? will. Sure, when you look at how expensive it is to build and maintain a road and how expensive it is to police a road and, and how expensive and, and well, how, there are associated expenses, how many that's true. How, many, how, many, how much we're losing um, with the time that it takes to get to and from our destinations. I mean, time is productivity, productivity is money. It takes me an hour and a half to get to work in the morning. It takes me two to two and a half hours to get home. That's <laughs> between that's three and fun. a half to four and a half hours of downtime that I could be with my family or working. And if you were on a rapid transit, you'd probably have Wi-Fi. Absolutely. These things all have to be quantitatively documented and verifiable. But I think for the most part, people are going to look at it. You have to understand it is going to pay for something. The ridership generally isn't going to pay for it in dollars. But as you point out, there's a lot of associated savings that go along with it that when you add those back in, and I had never thought of that, to be honest with you. Well, the, the, the reductions of uh, insurance premiums, for one. I mean, coming into the office this morning, I saw three racks. <laughs> you know, people get angry because it takes so long to get to work, and they're in a hurry, and they're trying to cut you off, and you're trying to cut them off, and road rage I was occurs. cut off on the way in. Just fortunately, I was paying attention and was able to hit the brake in time. So, you know, all of these things need to be documented, need to be verified, need to be clearly evident and need to be laid out on the table because these are all pieces that fit into the puzzle. I, I really love the way the airport is managed and I'd like to get Mr. Lapano on this show. Oh, I agree with I, you. I really would like him to talk about his dream for what it is, what it's going to be, and what it can be even into the future. You know, he's a Fortune 50 corporate exec kind of guy. He's an entrepreneur that thinks out of the box and runs hard and long. And he has put together the finest team has to, at, the, at our the airport are. of executives and support that I have seen in the private and public sector anywhere. And, you know, we're very fortunate to have a guy like him and his team in this market. It's going to make a huge difference. It is making a difference. Let's switch off the airport because I know there's a lot of things you want to get out. And this is your show and your 30 minutes. <laughs> You wanted to talk a little about the Public Transportation Commission. Yes. What would you like the people in the county to know about the situation that's going on now? The newspapers, of course, are churning up the internet situation with that company coming in. What do you think should happen? There's been a lot of misinformation put forth to the public, um, either by facts that weren't completely verified or misunderstandings or just sh sheerly for um, financial gain. The bottom line is Hillsborough County is a, has a unique situation. We have an agency called the Public Transportation Commission. This agency was created 40, 50 years ago to raise the qualities and standards of our automobiles and vehicles for hire, to protect consumers and to grow um, business and tourism opportunities in the Bay Area. Unfortunately, there's been a couple of bad apples along the way that created some bad publicity that keeps being rehashed and rehashed and rehashed. The bottom line is those few situations were unique and they are gone and have been gone for a, quite a while. And to rehash them is grossly misleading and unfortunate. The PTC is... Um, the regulatory board for taxis, limousines, um, tow trucks, and ambulances. Their primary purpose is to make sure that one, these vehicles are contemporary, that they are safe and they are up to date and, and well equipped, that the air conditionings work, that the tires are not bald, that the brakes work, that the interior is clean, that um, you're getting what you're paying for. They also check the drivers. They make sure they have clean driving records, that they're not drunks driving, you know, a limousine or a cab 
um, hauling people around with bad driving records. Um, they make sure that they're clean. Um, <clears throat> they also make sure that the companies have the adequate insurance and safeguards in place for the rider. But there's also something else they do that no one really talks about. There is two sides to the livery business. The side where you make money and the side where you lose money. Running back and forth to the airport, you make money. Going to and from business gigs during the day, you make money. Late night runs, you lose money. Runs from the entertainment district out to Plant City, Temple Terrace, Dade City, or the beaches, you lose money. Really? You do. The PTC requires that if you're going to run a cab or a limousine, or excuse me, a cab in Hillsborough County, that you have to run it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the service, and that you can't turn down a fare. So if you're a low-income person going to a low-income community, and it's a long drive, and it's in the middle of the night, and you're not going to get a fare coming back, you're going to be driving back with an empty vehicle, okay. you're losing money, but you've got to take that fare. And that's the reason why is we want everybody to have access to service. In return, we've got to make sure that there's an environment where you can make money. And that means giving you the shot at, at the profitable um, side of the business, which is the airport runs, the port runs, and the executive runs. So instead of having gypsies come in and out when they're... Taking are, the cream off the top. Sure, every time we have a convention, you know, the gypsies would want to come in here, run their cabs, leave when the convention is over and leave no service to anyone in between. We don't allow that. You know, if you want to come in here and, and, and run your business, you got to run your business year round. So what you're really doing is equating the PTC with people that have building licenses and things like that. It's no They're different. licensed to do business because they passed whatever test is necessary to do a business and get that license. Yes, it's no difference than than, than having an optician who is licensed fitting your eyeglasses or a dental hygienist who's licensed cleaning your teeth or um, you know a, a building contractor licensed who's building your pool or your home you know we want to make sure that for the consumer that you're getting what you're paying for that you're not putting yourself at risk what if today I went out and bought five cars got some trained drivers could I set up as a cab company Yes, but you'd have to go through the PCC and apply for a license. But, I, but there isn't a limited number of licenses, is no. that correct? There's a limited... In yet, some places there are limited numbers There's a of limited licenses. number of automobile permits based on population. And as the population grows, there's a formula that grows the permits. They're called medallions. And every year we have an auction of those medallions where you go online and you bid on the medallions. And I think last year we had 13, so there were 13 new permitted vehicles, and there was a great bidding process, and there was a preference given to small businesses so that the big companies couldn't just come in and gobble them all up. What would a medallion go for here? I understand in New York City it could be a million dollars. Yeah, in New York they're about a million and a half. In Miami they're about a million. Here in Hillsboro, they're about fifty-five thousand for one for one cab. For yes, but you got to have a lot of people ride in that cab to get fifty-five thousand. It's chattel, though. <clears throat> that one medallion, if you shut down your business, is a saleable item. Oh, you can you can will it, you can sell it, you can trade it. You now have something of value. It's a permit that is it's a not tangible an annual stamp. Thing. No, it's it's a it's a it's once a, you own it, you own it. Once you own it, you own it. And, and, and you can sell it or trade it. You can even borrow against it. And that's what a lot of the small companies want is something that they can take to the bank and say, look, this is worth 55 grand. I need to borrow against this because I need four or five cars in my fleet. What are we going to do, though, in, in, this, in this time of these things? Well, there's, I mean, I, I can go click, 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 bing, and... And call up a vehicle. Yeah. We've got about a dozen companies that run on apps today in the, in, in the Hillsborough market um, that you can dial them up, a cab or a limousine up on your phone and have them come and, and service you. There are a couple of new companies that want to come into our market and they want to undercut everybody else. 
So to be able to undercut everybody else, they, want, they, they don't want to have to follow our guidelines and requirements. One, they're not offering commercial um, insurance on their drivers. They're letting drivers use their own personal insurance. Well, there's not an insurance company around that issues personal insurance that will keep it intact for commercial use. Uh -huh. So you're basically, when you step into one of these cars, stepping into an uninsured They're situation. They're truly gypsies. They're truly gypsies. And, you know, the companies are advertising, well, you know, we're insured. You, the, the app company has a blanket umbrella policy for liability, but you got to sue them. And, <laughs> you know, for property damage and, and health um, insurance, uh, medical um, insurance, you could be long dead by the time the suit could clears. be long dead by the time your suit comes to or to, or that that company order. hasn't gone bankrupt then they're gone too because you have no control of them generally the way it works is the rider carries the insurance and you file a claim against the rider's insurance and immediately replaces your vehicle or or, or pays for your health expenses while you're in treatment and currently they're saying well you know our, our individual personal policies will do this all the insurance companies are telling us, no, they don't. So we're trying to get down right now, meet with the two or three companies that are wanting to come into the area. Um, I'll go ahead and say two of the names, Uber and Lyft, mm -hmm. are two of the three. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to determine what is true and what is false of what the claims that they're making. We're trying to determine what will it take to be able to provide an environment where they can operate but still ensure the public that they're going to have a safe vehicle with a safe driver with the adequate insurance in place in the event the unspeakable but, happens. But they wouldn't have medallions. So um, that would destroy the value of the medallions. That's a process that we're going to have to work <laughs> in and around. How do we do that? The, the world is changing very, very rapidly. Well, and the medallion process is something new that we went to just last year. Well, you know, with folks like you in political office, it's got to be not a nightmare with all the apps that come to these machines. Well, it's, 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 you know, politics and public service is one. It's not much different than the private sector where if you, you, you know, you got to stay in front of your game. You got to constantly be understanding, one, what is needed, two, what is wanted, and three, what is new well, and cutting Chris, edge. You do all of those Thank without you. a doubt and have for a lot of years of public service, I wish you many years of public service, and I hope you'll come back. Will you come back? I will, certainly. Thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, Victor Chris, District 2 County Commissioner. I'm Bill Hodges. This is Spotlight on Government. You're unique, you're special, you're great. Tell yourself so often because you are, you know. And we'll see you on the next Spotlight on Government. And again, Commissioner Chris, thanks for being here with me. Thank you for having me.